Today's episode is brought to you by our good friends over at COM4, your true partner for IoT connectivity. Unlock the future with COM4's free IoT test kit. Get up to five SIM cards, each with 100 megabytes of data, supporting 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, LTEM, and MBIoT. Revolutionize your IoT projects with ease and reliability. Start your IoT journey now at com4.no. Welcome, Sarhi, to the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So I want to kick this off by having you give a quick introduction about yourself and the company to our audience, if you wouldn't mind. Let's start from a company. I'm working from, uh, for a tech company, a software uh, and engineering, and I'm head of a department here. I'm in AI for a long time, started from a simple chat bots, uh, and then just dive into more and more in machine learning, you know, and uh, also uh, that part which are touching really human and uh, an algorithm uh, connection. From the company perspective, talk talk us through some of the stuff that you all focus on. Um, you know, industries that you're in, just to give a little more context as to you know what you're providing to the industry. You know, at this year, at this at this time, at this year, we are real uh, in humanity, even the regions this gap uh, communication human and AA. And uh, now we are receiving a lot of requests, really, for chatbot, smart chatbot, because we are also need to understand there are different chatbots like uh, intent recognition, etc. And LLM. Everyone talks. Everyone talks now about GPT and etc. But it also it's not only chatbot, and we are now resolving. One of the issues, like automating some some stuff in, in uh, fintech. Let me ask, what what have you seen over the last eighteen months or so with the growth of GPT and LL, LLMs in as they relate specifically to IoT? So, how have you seen those technologies play a role? The different tools that are out there now. How are you seeing that rise in in adoption? What I see now is just the beginning of AI, AI and IoT. Because what uh, we saw um, before, there was really social gap between uh, in human and IIT uh, and AI at all. Because um, let's take medical stuff, because uh, in Ukraine we have uh, some companies which are uh, works in this sector and uh, there was some task related really to apply AI there. And uh, before there was a gap, like, you know, just I will try to explain a temple. This human, I don't trust AI. I want real doctor to work with me. And now uh, I'm receiving notification. Uh, health, we have a company, Health UI. Uh, I also work, uh, I also uh, use this company. They are uh, starting to implement some uh, parts there. Also based on based on LLM, GPT, and uh, ML uh, at all. I am curious to see how over time people's relationship with technology becomes more trusting with things like healthcare. I think it's interesting to see like there is there was a story I can't remember exactly when it was it had to be 6 8 months ago where a mother was taking her um son to all these doctors to figure out what was wrong with him and none no doctor could figure it out so she actually went into ChatGPT put all the different symptoms in and it spit out potential things or potential diagnosis and the she took it to one of the doctors and it actually on that list had one of the potential one something that none, none of the doctors ever thought about and it was actually what was what was wrong with the child and it ended up you know fixing him so that's a very kind of interesting way for people to start to build trust but then on the other side if the information is is incorrect then that there's a risk there right right it's yeah it's just like people always tell you don't google your symptoms cuz it's going to tell you so many different things that you could have a problem with right you're totally right. You know, we really, for now, we, we still need to be careful with uh, with LLM and GPD at all, because uh, you, uh, still we have hallucinations and uh, etc. related. But uh, still, you know, as more people, even even, even simple chat, more people start chatting, some start asking questions, they start to trust a bit. Uh, of course, uh, we, we we still need to to, to keep in mind this uh, this uh, let's say security breach. But uh, slowly we are, we are just getting used to, me as a person, I'm just getting used to talk to AI. And uh, this opens uh, different uh, dimensions, like uh, different uh, different opportunities. You will, uh, okay, uh, you, for a fine tech, for uh, um, legal and uh, medical stuff, and etc. I think it's interesting because like, I feel like there's been a big attempt over, I don't know, the last like three, four, five years 
to make assistance, personal assistance, something that people can trust and use. And I, I personally never found them to be that helpful. Uh, maybe once in a while I asked Siri what, you know, for the weather or something. But beyond that, I don't know if it ever took off the way people were hoping it would. But with, with the growth of GPT, LLMs and other AI, uh, I think you're going to start to see hopefully a different relationship be formed between those types of applications, especially in in the enterprise space as well. I think that's an interesting spot to kind of examine the growth of assist chat assistance um, between customers and even internally, we're seeing people trust like co-pilot tools and things like that as well. It was like maybe three years I was implemented one chat, but actually it is a quality AI chat, but it, it was just simple ML uh, intent record based on intent recognition. It is still a machine learning user, but not really LLM. But, uh, you know, it really saved, it saved uh, some amount of uh, money for a uh, company. And I think what's interesting too is, is when you move outside of just the, the customer support side of things, these personal assistants have access to be fueled by more and more data because of IoT on a personal level and in a, in, in a corporate company level. That's what's always fascinated me about how well IoT and AI work together, right? You have the physical world, whether it's in the consumer space and, and you know, we as people, or in the enterprise space where you might be measuring different things, you're able to now collect data off the physical world and put it into a system that can better analyze it for use. And that's where AI and IoT are so, so, so well intertwined. From your experience in the companies that you work with, the industries you work in, where are you seeing the biggest impact that AI is, I guess, playing a, a, a role that maybe it hasn't played before that also IoT is, is being used? Even talking about digital twins, it's something, it's something, it, it's a modern world, you know, but Phil, it, it, it brings some, some interesting stuff there. Uh, let's imagine you have um, uh, update really hard access devices. You you will have a so you you have a lot of detectors. You have a lot of information based from that, but you cannot access it. You cannot uh, quickly experiment with it. You are creating digital twins and AI help there, and you can even really experiment and uh, do adjustments and do some um, some stuff there. It's it's one thing. You know, uh, not talking about, uh, let's say, enterprise. Yesterday, I have a friend, colleague, friend, Yuri. We were in his house. Uh, he he built house uh, not so long time ago. A few months ago, he just moved there. But still, he was building it, uh, knowing and considering that he wants to have a smart house. He has the solar panels. Uh, yesterday, we bought he bought uh, Nordic Cindy, Cindy 53. For prototyping, but still, it's it's it, it's interesting because actually we are we, we are planning. Okay, what we will do is that we can work inside of house. And uh, now uh, you you know that I'm from Ukraine. Still, we have a um, tough uh, some issues with electricity, etc. You need to think about um, power saving. And here is where IT and AI uh, comes to play to the play. You know, you are going at home. Uh, you. You can have a visual part of AI. You can have a language part of AI, and then your uh, freezer will understand. Uh, the, uh, he gave you some lemonade or maybe whiskey. Is the end. It's, it's, it, is, it, it is interesting because now we are moving to the part where IoT uh, on device. I'm not talking even about ve uh, automatic vehicle. It everywhere. It just moving. It's, it's a big trend. But we are talking even about robots with, which uh, um, helps you, which which uh, which uh, makes your life easier at home. And here, where you have a lot of detectors, you're uh, they're working, and you need to communicate with them. It's one 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 part where you are used, using machine learning algorithm to make some predictions. Okay, when you need to to have light on or light off, etc. But another part when you want to ask, when you want to interact with them. It's just just a start, but big dimension for a work for for improvement. You know, you extend that out in the consumer space to all the different personal information that, like health information that you're able to collect off different devices, whether it's a smartwatch, whether it's your phone, you know, you, you name it, fitness trackers, things along those lines. We're getting more access to, and we're getting more information about ourselves and our own health, and being able to analyze it in real time to help optimize our lifestyles, help. Be, help us become more healthy 
And then that also translates over to having different information that you're able to pass over to your healthcare providers in order to better understand what's going on if you go to the doctor. You know, they're able to, you have more information that you can have a conversation with your doctor, um, which I think is very interesting to see how IoT devices are being used or devices that people might not even realize are like, you know, IoT, but they are collecting data and they're able to use them um, for their own benefit in many different ways when it comes to the health. Yes, but we need to touch a part of security. You know, as for me, it's uh, one of the uh, challenges for IoT and AI. I don't have answer for it, but uh, what we see in the world, um, we need to resolve this issue to move forward. Let's break away from the consumer space a little bit and talk more about enterprise. I wanted to get your thoughts on enterprise industries where you're seeing the biggest impact for for AI. Um, IoT being used is is obviously an I, I, something that we talk about a lot, but when you bring those two technologies or groups of technologies together, it unlocks so many different things. And we've talked about healthcare, as we just talked about. We've talked about supply chain. We've talked about industrial. We've even dabbled in, in retail a good bit. But what about other industries? Like one that's, I think, I don't know if people know a lot about is how it's being used in the military, how it's being used in the defense sector, how it's being used to kind of in those environments. How are you seeing, how are you seeing AI and IoT kind of play a role in, in, in the military space that maybe it, it hasn't been able to do before? And what is it enabling? What is it allowing, you know, countries and groups of people um, to do? We have a war and it's, we are touching this uh, part really closely. I'm not talking about such a drone. Uh, I mean, air drones, but uh, still, I want to focus on it because it's a device. Now we have a challenge to have uh, AI really with the brains there because let's say uh, we are taking a book taker, we are taking care about soldiers, about their safety. If this means that you need to be far away from a front, much far, and but you should be able to do uh, your job with your drone. You are facing issue when, uh, when there is radio electronic uh, warfare. You are losing contact with your drone at some point, but you need to be sure that last mile will be done. So one challenge is, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I can talk more about it because of, uh, yes, confidential. But uh, still, we are taking care about uh, to do this last mile, uh, to do the job efficient. It's one, it's one thing. Another thing, when uh, uh, not touching this part last mile, but even uh, when you are uh, using your drone and you are just taking, um, you just need to see what what is happening. It's easy to to use your drone at night because you are have you have a night vision and it's easy to see what is moving, what is not moving. But uh, at daylight, um, it's really hard for a human. So here is the, we are also uh, working on a visual vision part of uh, this stuff. Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting point because I think, you know, we've talked about computer vision and the use of cameras as basically devices, right? They're just, they're sensing from a visual standpoint and they're able to identify different things going on. And, and I do, it does make a lot of sense on how that could play a role in a war, right? Like being able to identify certain risks, identify where people are, where they are not, where there's potential higher threat of an area before you send any troops into a certain area based on, you know, however you program the algorithm to pick up and detect things visually. It's a very interesting challenge and very useful challenge and as it should be done uh, as soon as possible. We don't have much time. When you know, you know, let's say you know your enemy is, is using this kind of technology, do you think that the other side will try to come up with countermeasures to confuse and mistake and, you know, create things visually that might throw off the cameras and the computer vision experience. We already face it, so this issues and we are working on it. Uh, I'm not sure that I can tell a lot of details, but uh, yes, it's, uh, it's not an issue. Are there any other industries outside of, you know, the military, the healthcare and stuff that you're seeing um, kind of advances that, that are interesting? I was working as Many years ago, I was working on a uh, SAT uh, specialist on one agricultural company. One of the challenges was, so just imagine, examples, just imagine, you have a farm with uh, 5,000 cows. It's a process. It means that sh flow should be, you need to inseminate this batch, you need to wait uh, for a uh, uh, while they are waiting for a cow, uh, this batch and this period, then it's a process of, so you need to plan, you need to plan. 
uh, it means that you need to, uh, you have a target, for example, to intimidate this week, such amount of cows. If you will not detect that they are in heat, you will lose them. And uh, then you will have a problem with the um, managing even place for this house because you have a place for 20 cows, but you have intimidated this week 10 cows and next week 40 cows, you don't have a place, etc. etc. It's, it's a big issue. And uh, here is uh, uh, we were talking with uh, my friend, which is director of this company, to apply visual uh, so IoT detectors and uh, AI algorithms to detect if cows in it is in heat. It also depends on the cow behavior. How active is it? Yes. So uh, it it really helps. We've seen a lot with um, just cow tracking in general and being able to. Early, early detection for any kind of illness uh, issues and stuff with the herd, right? Uh, which is a big deal. If one cow gets sick and it can spread, then it can it can ruin an entire um, herd of cows, which you know is is something that it, they probably didn't have insights into as well in the past. So the earlier they can detect those things, the better. So yeah, it's very interesting to see how we're, they're using those technology like AI and IoT to to improve the overall experience for for cattle farming. Um, and agriculture in general. I think one thing that people have to to be able to understand and decipher for themselves is which companies that they choose to work with um, actually are do actually are doing real AI. I think we've seen over the last almost year now the the addition of just AI, artificial intelligence, thrown into the lingo, the marketing language, the jargon used by companies to promote what they do, but. In reality, how many companies are actually implementing these algorithms and enhancing the experience as opposed to just doing some type of data analysis, which was done before? It's not necessarily, I guess, you know, in, in, in the realm of what we're talking about, you know, quote unquote AI. So that's what I think is going to be interesting is, is the ones that are really doing it, how they kind of hopefully rise to the top and the ones that, you know, kind of are in a sense falsely saying they do it, probably not um, be able to prove out what their their claims are. But I do think the thing that powers AI the most is is good data. And when it comes to the physical world, that's where IoT comes in, right? And you know, uh, still we need to mm, reach this gap uh, between uh, how human accept it. Sometimes you are not ready to have a metal sink between you, which does, uh, which wash your dishes. Right. No, I agree. I, I did the trust is the trust level too, right? With technology, like we said from the beginning, we're talking about uh, assistance. We're talking about our, our data you mentioned. Um, so trust over time grows. I think where we are now, if we look at the more mature technologies and the more mature devices that we use, there's a trust continuum that we've gone through and a process, right, that we've gone through to get to the point where we trust certain devices and certain technologies more than we did when they first came out. And I think that's going to be the same with any new technology. AI is getting there, but it's still, people have a lot of questions, people have a lot of concerns um, on a personal level and on an enterprise level. But I think the hopefully the net the net is a benefit for all of us, um, and it's just something that's going to take time, take more, more, um, more adoption, more success. See, companies and individuals seeing more success and good experience with these technologies, and hopefully we see a limit on the the negative side, right, and the negative use of these technologies um, for for reasons that don't don't benefit us, um, you know, for humanity or for for business purposes. So. Um, It'll be interesting to keep an eye on, but I think, you know, we're going in the right direction with a lot of this stuff, um, which is exciting. You know, I just was thinking, you are, you are talking about big data. Also, predictive analytics is, we have so many manufacturers which have sensors, which have the data, but still they haven't moved their, let's say, main platform from Excel to, uh, to uh, IT. And it's a big, uh, it's also a big opportunity. I think the, the transformation, the digital transformation for a lot of these organizations to adopt these technologies, that's a big hurdle for a lot of them. But um, but the, but the more they see their competitors, the more they have you know internal stakeholders who who understand them and um, can can vouch for them, the the more likely we're going to see this adoption kind of increase. Or you know a lot of these companies will start with a pilot, start with something very small. But as they start to see successes, I think that natural attachment, natural um, interest, and relationship in a positive way with these technologies will grow which is good for everybody. Well, Sari, thank you so much for, for, for coming on and chatting with me. And we'll uh, hopefully speak again soon. Thank you for a nice talk.